we're going to jump into this morning, Acts chapter 8. I'm using NIV this today. So Acts chapter 8, the title of the message, Wanda already let it out, but that is Relational Evangelism, the Supernatural Way. We've already heard testimonies to that this morning uh, in the communion as well as the EMT summary video testimony of supernatural evangelism or relational evangelism a supernatural way when I concluded last week's message I talked about six different styles that God has put in us and usually we have one even though we can probably use all six it's just the way that God created us to share his love with others and we talked about those six different styles and when I finished up I asked the question where's the relational style And where's the supernatural style? Well, the reality is that relational and supernatural is through every one of those six different styles. It's not a separate category. It's actually in all of those together. So this Sunday, I'm picking up on the fact of talking about the relational evangelism, the supernatural way. There's many different different, uh, places I've kind of gone in Scripture in order to um, illustrate this. But the Lord led me to the book of Acts in an encounter that Philip had with an Ethiopian. And as I read down through this passage, I want you to pick out what is supernatural and what is relational. Because as you'll see, we'll walk down through this passage one at a time. I'll ask you, okay, was that relational or was that supernatural? And we'll see both in play here as this person understood who Jesus was and decided to say yes and then live his life for him. So Acts chapter 8, beginning of verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, to the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem. Is that supernatural or is that relational? The right answer. Verse 27. So he started out on his way And he met an Ethiopian unit, an important official in charge of the treasury of Candace, the queen of of Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship. Is that relational or is that supernatural? Relational, exactly. Verse 28, or uh, 29. The spirit said to Philip, go to the chariot and stay near it. Is that relational or supernatural? Verse 30, then Philip ran to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading, Philip asked him. Is that relational or supernatural? I call that out of breath. (laughs) Verse 31, how can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Supernatural or relational? Verse 32, the eunuch was reading this passage of scripture. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, as a lamb before the shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of, this, who can speak of his descendants, or, for his life was taken from the earth? Is this supernatural or relational? Supernatural. There's 66 books in the book of Isaiah, 66 chapters. This guy could have been in any one of those. He just happened to be in chapter 53 that's describing Jesus. Supernatural. Let's continue. Verse 34. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who is this prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Is that relational or supernatural? Relational. Relational. And then Philip began with the very passage of Scripture and told him about the good news of Jesus. Supernatural or relational? Relational. Verse 36. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water. Remember, they, they were on a desert road. They came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? Is that supernatural or relational? Supernatural. Then 38. And, the angel gave, uh, and he gave the orders to stop the chariot. And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. Is that supernatural or relational? Relational, I would say. It's the baptism. Verse 39. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again and went on rejoicing. Is that supernatural or relational? Supernatural. Verse 40, and Philip, or Philip, however, appeared to 
Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. Is that supernatural or relational? It's actually both. He was supernaturally in, uh, placed and then he went about the town talking both. So kind of pulled one on you there in the end. I wanted to illustrate the fact that when Pil uh, Philip was sharing the good news with this man that wanted to hear, he was hungry to know the truth, that both relational and supernatural elements were in play. And I think that we as God's people need to understand that in the days in which we live, we need to be relational, but if all it, that we are is relational, we're missing the other half, and that is the supernatural. How do we then incorporate both into our presentation of the gospel? Well, first of all, we need to identify their need. We need to identify the need of the person that God wants us to share with. In verse 30 and 31, it says, Then Philip ran to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me? And so what happened is that Philip identified a need in that person that, that the individual wanted to understand the, the gospel and wanted to understand what he was reading, needed it explained to him. And what I've found is that in order to identify a need in someone, there are several things that we have to go through. Number one, we can ask for it. We can ask for the need. When I'm sensing that someone uh, hasn't heard the gospel before, oftentimes one of the questions that I will use is, tell me about your spiritual journey. And that simple open-ended question, it's non-threatening, and I've found that everybody has a spiritual journey. Even atheists have a spiritual journey. And so we have to realize that people, when they're entering into dialogue, sometimes we ask for it. Well, tell me about your spiritual journey. And in that process, we uncover a need along the way. Jesus did that when he was talking to the woman at the well. He asked for it. Give me a drink. And as a result of that simple question, give me a drink, it opened up the door for more conversation to happen. And then he got to another point and he said, go call your husband. And that opened up another door for a uh, conversation to happen, even a deeper level. And so Jesus did. I find that I do. We just need to ask for it at times. The next thing in, in discovering a need is to discuss it. Sometimes people have the need, but they don't really uh, realize what the need is. And so you need to discuss it with them. And we see that happening in, in, as, uh, as Philip and the eunuch, as they were talking together, there was a discussion that was going on. It wasn't Philip imposing his agenda on this Ethiopian. There was talk, there was discussion, there was dialogue that was taking place. And oftentimes in discussion with people, sometimes I get to the place and I realize that they are ready to ac accept Christ. And other times I find that they're not ready to accept Christ. And oftentimes what I'll do in that case is I'll say, you know, I don't feel like that you're ready to receive Christ right now, but how would you feel if I would explain the gospel to you or the good news to you should you ever at a point in time in your future be ready? And I've never had anybody turn me down. Everybody said, sure, I'd like to know. I'm not ready now, but I'd like to know. And see, the, the reason is because it's a verse that I'll end with here after two more, is that Jesus said that nobody comes to me except the Father draws them. And we have to understand the supernatural element that when people are hearing good news and open to good news and committing their life to Christ, there's this supernatural element of the Holy Spirit drawing them to the Father, to understand, uh, drawing them to understand Jesus. And we have to recognize that in our presentation. One of the other thing I do in discussing the gospel is I don't use Christianese, like provenient grace and justification and sanctification. I remember my friend Roy, he was, uh, we were in Tulsa at the time, and we were eating lunch under a tree, and we happened to see this Native American that was drunk, and Roy decided to share the gospel with him. And he's talking about justification and provenient grace and, and, and sanctification. This guy's going, wow, man, give me another bottle. I can't handle this. I mean, it was, it was hilarious. I was like, Roy, cut the Christianese, man. Get on this guy's level. 
And uh, Roy just didn't get it, but that's all right. He was, he was graduating from seminary and needed to practice, right? <laughs> so that's what he came out with. Kind of funny at times, but the reality is sometimes we use language that is barriers to people rather than bridges. And so we have to uh, not, I mean, there's certain, certain terms or words you have to use, but there's also other choices that we can use as well. The next uh, thing that I have there as far as uh, discerning a need or, or finding a need is to discern it. To be able to discern what it is. Jumped in the chariot with uh, this Ethiopian and, and he, he right away saw that he was in Isaiah 53. The guy was telling him that. So he discerned that. And there's, that's, the, that's the supernatural part of discovering someone's need. Is that God shows us something they need that they don't even realize it's a need. And that's the discerning part of uncovering that. Uh, Nicodemus came to Jesus. And he said, you must be from God because of the miracles that happen through your life. And then he went on to say, how can I enter into this? And Jesus said, you must be born again in order to get into the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus didn't get it. He said, you mean I, I got to put my mom through being born again, again? <laughs> Jesus said, no, it doesn't happen that way. It happens with faith. You're born of the Spirit and water that you were, are born again. And so uh, Nicodemus had to figure out that, that he, was, he was thinking differently than the way that God was. And so uh, God gives us the ability to discern. When, when Jesus met Peter for the first time, he gave him a prophetic word. It was supernatural. He told Peter what he would become, not who he was now. And I'm sure that was stirring for him to hear that. When Jesus met Nathaniel, that was also one of his 12 disciples. The first thing that Jesus was, was, did is gave him a word of knowledge. He said, Nathaniel, I saw you under the tree before you came here. He, and Nathaniel went, wow, this guy is like from outer space. He's, he, he's not from here. This is an amazing. And so the supernatural was in play to discern the need for the individual in order to share the gospel or to come and follow Jesus. The last one is to pray for it. To pray that the person would uh, understand they have a need for God in their life. Nick and I got the opportunity to go to England some years ago and we were having a conversation with a fella, just a small gathering, and he talked about a town in, in northern England where everybody in the town was coming to Christ. He said it was amazing. I, I needed to see it for myself. And I went up there and we had a small gathering and they said, just walk out into the streets and the first person you see, just ask him if they would like to come to Jesus. He said, I didn't believe it, but I decided to do it. I walked up to this crusty character. I thought, this guy won't want Jesus and just approached him and said, sir, would you like to know Jesus? And the guy said, yeah, I believe I would. How do I do that? He was blown away. He was like, this is too amazing. But we asked the question, well, how does, that, how does that take place? Why does that happen in certain places? Well, here's the answer. For 10 years, the pastors in that community prayed. 10 years together that God would save the lost. And then suddenly Jesus invaded that town with his presence and evangelism was made easy. Are we willing? If we would know that 10 years from now, everybody in Winchester... Would, would either know or call on the name of Jesus. Know about, have a presentation of the gospel or call on the name of Jesus. If we would know that, would we commit ourselves to 10 years of prayer? Asking God to expose the need of people that don't even know they have a need for him. Would we be willing to do that? This town in England did that. Those pastors are so committed that they prayed. I don't know how often they prayed, but they prayed for 10 years and then the Holy Spirit came and exposed the need and people came to Christ. Hannah, that's in our midst here this morning, she was shared in Pray Winchester a couple of, um, probably about a couple of months ago that she was taking her car to get serviced at one of the dealerships in the area and her appointment was early in the morning. As I recall, it was like 7 in the morning. Who else is up at a dealership at 7 in the morning but Hannah? So she was there and she was sitting there waiting for her car to get finished and about that time a young lady came in to get her car serviced and Hannah was sitting on one side of the room and this young lady was sitting on the other side of the room. But God spoke to Hannah and said, I want you to tell that young lady that I love her, that she is loved by God, that she is special in his eyes. Hannah said, I'm willing to do that, but how is this going to happen? There's no relational way. I'm here. She's there. How is this going to take place? Well, wouldn't you know, the bathroom 
was on the other side of the room from where this lady was sitting. And she gets up and goes to the bathroom, has to pass Hannah on the way. I don't know if they said hi along the way. But then the lady comes out of the bathroom and she actually stops in front of Hannah and opens up conversation with her. And Hannah said, okay, God, this is pretty clear. I'm going to tell her. And she did. She said, you know, I want you to know that God loves you and thinks you're very special. And the woman responded, he does? He does? And that's the exchange that took place. You see, that was both relational and it was supernatural. And it can happen to any one of us in our day and time. Again, I want to highlight John 6, that says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them. That's the supernatural element. Number two, that is to share good, good, God's good news with them. Once you discern they have a need that they want to hear, then you're ready to share the good news. As we see that Philip was prepared, it says in 34 and 35 of chapter 8, the eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is this prophet talking about? Someone himself or someone else? Then Philip began from the very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. Philip had a plan. Philip understood from the place that this Ethiopian was, he was going to take him through the birth, life, resurrection, uh, death, resurrection of Jesus, and even ascension that he was returning again. Philip had a plan. My question to you, if you're a believer in Christ this morning, do you have a plan to share the gospel with somebody when they say, I want to know who Jesus is? Do you have a plan? Yeah. Dwight Moody it was an evangelist back in the early 1900s. Someone came to him and said, I don't like your plan of how you share the gospel. He says, well, what plan do you have? And the person said, I don't have a plan. Dwight said, I like mine better. So if you have a plan, I like your plan. If you don't have a plan, I like mine better. Ever since I've uh, committed my life to the Lord and, and recognized that, it, uh, that we're called to share the good news with others, I've developed, or not me, it's really a plan that I've made it my own. And, and I use a, a very familiar scripture, maybe not to unbelievers, but to believers, is John 3.16. I've really had two different plans that I've used, but they've always been based on the Scripture. And I want to give it to you this morning. And I also want to give you, uh, before you leave today, on the table, sorry for those watching online, you'll have to come next week and get your own copy But uh, if you're in the area. If you're not in the area, write the office, email Chris, just bomb his email box this week and say you'd like a copy of Why Say Yes to Jesus and we'll send it out to you. But we're going to give you copies of each one of these. You can have two or three or four, put it in your glove box, put it in your purse. I don't guess men have a purse, but um, I got, there are man purses today, so maybe you can upgrade. Uh, have, put it in your glove box. That you, you, you never know when God might have you hand this to someone. Be a conversation starter. Say, hey, this is important to me. Will you read this and let's talk about it. And so this is the purpose. We're going to hand them out for you today, free for you to take and have available uh, for you. But really, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I like that word begotten. Some translations say one and only son. I don't really like that, and here's why. Just a little commentary. I wouldn't use that with people I'm sharing with, but because um, Jesus is not God's one and only son. We're sons and daughters by adoption, but he is God's only begotten son. Jesus was born of a woman. He is God's only begotten son, but he's not God's one and only son because we, by adoption, become sons of God positionally. Bless you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. That's the basis of, of what I share with people. Now in that verse, there's two things that you need to know, and there's two things you need to do. Many times when the good news is shared, it's shared. You don't need to do anything. You just need to know this. You don't need to do anything. Well, I take issue with that. Jesus said the work of the, 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 the work of of, uh, he said, to believe is the work of God. I'll get this straight here. To believe is the work of God. 
So Jesus said even to believe takes work. And so out of this verse, there's two things you need to know, and there's two things you need to do. The first one is you need to know God loves you. You didn't decide that for yourself. He decided it for you. He didn't even ask your opinion whether or not you're a lovable person. He decided that on his own. It says, for God so loved the world. He loves you right where you're at. I don't care how many hurts you have, how many, how many offenses you're carrying, how many addictions you have. God loves you right where you're at. And his love is always consistent. Ours goes up and down. Depending upon what people do or don't do or choose or don't cho or what they believe or they don't believe, our love for other people goes up and down. But God's doesn't. It stays constant, and it's always 100% all the time towards you. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? That's good news, isn't it? That's what God says. And so you need to know that, that he loves you. He made that choice, not you. The second thing is he gave you a gift, and that gift is righteousness. He gave you a gift of righteousness. We didn't even know that we needed it, but he knew we did, and so he did it for us. He gave us a gift of righteousness, and that gift is his own son that came and lived a sinless life. And then I oftentimes ask this question to the person I'm talking to. I say, is it possible for you to live a perfect life? I'm talking about make the right decision all the time, may have the right action all the time, have the right thoughts all the time. Ooh, is that possible for you to do that? What am I doing in that question? Creating a need. And if the person's real honest, they say, I can't do that. Which is precisely the point. We can't. But God said, I want to take care of that for you. I want to fix that for you. And I want to send my son, and I want to take that which you are incapable of doing, living a perfect life, so that you and I could be con connected and joined together. I want to take that, that life of my son, and I want to exchange that for yours. In other words, he did it for you. His life for yours. Your sinful, imperfect life, he gets the punishment for, and your imperfect life, you get his righteousness. That's a deal, isn't it? Wow, that's a gift. And so that is the gift that he gave for. You need to know that, that God gave you a gift. That he took himself and did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. He did it for us. Now he said, I want you to, we'll get to the next part, what we have to, to do, and that is we have to believe it. That's something you have to do. You have to believe it's for you. You have to believe that you need it. You have to believe that it counts for you today. You have to believe that. That's something you have to do. Believing is something we do. <laughs> it's not something that you just have a great thought about. We're in the book of Acts today. We're not in the book of thoughts. We're in the book of Acts. God manifests himself. He, he, he shows himself real. And as we look at this, this gift that, that, that were given to us in Jesus, we need to know that he took care of everything that we need of. God took care of it. He provided for us. And we see that in Jesus. And then he said that there's two other things that, that you need to, to do, and that is believe. Believe it counts for you. Believe that you can have it, that you can make this exchange. God wants to do it for you. If you and I would go out to eat here after the service, and you ate your food, and I ate my food, and I decided, you know what, you ate your food, you should pay for your food. But instead, I'm going to pay for your food. I'm going, to I'm going to take your check when the waiter brings it out, and I'm going to pay it for you. You ate it, you should pay for it, but I'm going to pay it for you. That's exactly what Jesus did for us. Far greater. But that's a, an illustration of what he did. That's great news. We have to believe that. It's for us. And then the final thing that we have to do is we have to receive it. We have to not just believe it, but receive it. James says that the demons believe and shudder because they will never receive it. But we get to. We get to receive that gift. We get to receive that love. And that's what the gospel is all about. That's the good news. What we can't do for ourselves, he did for us. We have to believe it and we have to receive it. And that's the good news. When I get to that end, I'll ask the person whether or not they understand and are clear and, and ask them if they would like to make that decision. It, it's, I'm just called to be a transmitter. 
I'm called to do it in a relational way and not necessarily in a way that's abrasive or unkind or kind to create a need that's not there. If they don't have a need, you're actually wasting your time. If you don't have a plan, you'll never be effective in leading someone to Christ. You'll never be effective if you don't have a plan. If you don't, if you don't, if you don't see the need, if the need's not evident, you're wasting your time. Because Jesus says the Father's drawing them. Not you, not your plan. The Father is drawing them. But yet we can, we can uh, ask it, we can, we can discern it, we can discuss it, and we can pray it. And then God will make it clear to them and you. All right. Sealing their salvation, number three. Sealing their salvation. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here's water. What can stand in the way of me being baptized? Obviously, some of the conversation was left out because of where they started, jumping in the chariot, identifying Isaiah 53 to where they ended. Philip shared the good news about Jesus. And so the eunuch is like excited. He's ready. He's like, I'm ready for water baptism. Now, there's a, there's a sect of Christianity that will teach you that you have to be water baptized in order to complete your salvation. I believe the, the whole of Scripture does not teach that. Now, being water baptized is, is a, an important step that Jesus commanded us to take. But to be saved, he says, you need to believe and you need to receive. There's something we do but what our baptism is like would be like a marriage. It's a public ceremony of saying, I'm married to Jesus. We saw baptisms on the, on, the, on the summary video this morning. That's like people standing up publicly and say, I'm married to Jesus. Well, the couple actually got engaged probably in private. But then they publicly come. That's what water baptism is all about. But your salvation is sealed because you believe and the other aspect is that you say it. So there's two things that I understand in sealing our salvation that are important to God. The first is there's an internal belief. In Mark chapter 4, uh, I'm sorry, Mark chapter 1 verse 14 and 15, that after John was put into prison, Jesus went to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. He says, the time has come that the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. So our salvation is sealed when we choose to, we take action, we believe. We say, God, you're at the top. There's other people in, in my life. There's other gods that we can believe in. They're out there. You can put your faith in your money. You can put your faith in your family. Put faith in your job. Put your faith in the government. Put your faith in medical community. Put your faith in a doctor. There's all kinds of other gods out there that we can put our faith in. The question is, will we put Jesus first and let him decide how he is working through those other authorities in our life rather than letting those authorities decide how Jesus works through our life? It's backwards. So we have to come to the place of deciding, no, Jesus is first. And I'll let him decide how those other authorities work or don't work in my life. There's an, that's something internal that happens. The other is there's an external voice that we give to it. And that comes out in Romans chapter 10, 9 through 13. It says, if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart, that's internal, that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth, that's external, that you profess your faith and are saved. The scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. Let's pause there. Did you catch that? Anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. The world wants to shame us today because we're followers of Christ. But this verse is very clear. Anyone who believes in Jesus, puts them first, will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of them all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. If you call on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. Not might be or could be or can be. You will be if you're calling on the name of the Lord. 
more recently had a man made an appointment with me. I didn't know him before. I knew of him, but didn't know him before he came into my office. And so he didn't know why he was there. I kind of guessed why he was there. And we began to talk about his salvation. And uh, he seemed to have some understanding of what the gospel was, but uh, not, didn't seem to be real clear in his mind. And so, I, again, I did what I normally do when someone's unclear. I said, well, let me share, and you can decide whether or not you're lined up with it. And if you're not, then we'll get in line if you want to. If not, you want to stay out of line, then that's up to you. But let me share. He was like, great. So I shared what I did here, John 3.16, rolled through everything. And I got to the end, and he said, that's what I believe. He said, yeah, that's what you were talking. That's, I understand that. I get that. I believe. And then I went a step further. I said, have you ever said an out loud prayer? to that effect. He got like, no, I never have. I said, and read to him in Romans 10, 9 and 10, I said, God wants you to complete your salvation, not just internally, but also say it out loud. And he's like, well, where's the out loud prayer at? <laughs> so I went and got my booklet, and we opened up to a page here, and uh, we bowed our heads, and he said an out loud prayer for the first time in his life for his salvation. That's how it works. There's something internal, but there's also something external that takes place in our salvation. Number four, what just happened? Oftentimes we'll say that when something surprising takes place and, and we were surprised. Well, what, what just happened? Like, uh, yeah, the computer side decided to update in the middle of the service and turned all the lights off. We're like, what just happened? So that's what happened. Anyhow, we'll get it fixed for next week and try to schedule the updates at a different time besides Sunday morning. I think it's a conspiracy behind it, but we'll just let that one go. <laughs> what just happened? When somebody says yes to Jesus, what just happened? I think this is very important. And as I lead people to Christ in, in, in more later times of my life, I talk about this. Um, it says when they, when they came out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. What just happened? <laughs> Whoa, here he is, here he's not. Yeah, the eunuch probably asked that, but he didn't really care. The eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. The first thing that happens is that when you come to Christ or, or repent in your life, the first thing that happens, you'll experience times of refreshing. That's what happens to me. I get refreshed. I got refreshed when I committed my life to Christ. I get refreshed every time God shows me something I need to repent of, something I've been disobeying him, and I get it right. Every time I come back into alignment with God, I get refreshed. I'm like, wow, this is awesome because there's something that happens in me that's jumping to say I'm back in alignment with God. Acts 3.19, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. And I found that true in my life. This Ethiopian, he didn't care where Philip went. And maybe he got, you know, fell out of the chariot and got run over. He didn't care. He just like found Jesus and he's, he's rejoicing. The second thing about what just happened is you've been transferred out of one kingdom into another. Instantly, when you say yes to Jesus, there's a transfer from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Now, we don't sometimes understand what it means to live, move, and think, and have our being in the kingdom of light yet. But I want to tell you that the moment you say yes to Jesus, you're transferred out of darkness into light. That's what happens. It says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14, For he has rescued, some translations say transferred, he has transferred us from the domain of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son that he loves in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. There's a radical rescue from one kingdom to another the moment in your heart and you say with your mouth that I want Jesus to become Lord, you are out of the kingdom of darkness and you are in the kingdom of light. And many times we don't realize that or let people know that that's just what happened. You left one and you entered another. Now you have access to the throne of God 24-7. Not just coming to church. Not just when somebody pray, uh, prays. 24-7. Now you have access with him. You're entering a new relationship that you never had before. You may have known about God, but now you're going to uh, know him. There's a difference between knowing about him Versus knowing him. 
You're entering a new relationship that you never had before because you transferred kingdoms. And the final thing is that you have a nature exchange. You have a nature exchange. We were all born with a nature that was opposed to God. I believe there's a time where, and Scripture teaches this, there's a time of innocence that a child that is born that grows up, there's this stage of, of innocence that, and I don't know when it ends and when it begins, but I recognize that, that God points out that, that children, when they come, uh, when they're born, there's this stage where, where it's, it's like a safe zone. If they would die, they would go to be with Jesus. But then there's a time when a child begins to recognize the difference between right and wrong. And obviously that happens in the home and with parents and different things that happens. Even scripture it talks about people, when they come of age, they begin to realize right from wrong. David, when he lost his son after seven days, he made the declaration that, that, uh, that he won't come back to be with me, I'll go to be with him. So David recognized as he was going to heaven one day, he would see his child again. So there's this place in the human nature, and, I, and again, it's just God's grace. But then there's a, there's a time where we begin to awaken and realize there's a choice that we have. There's right and wrong. There's no, there's yes, there's obedience, there's rebellion. There's this time, and it follows, uh, can follow all the way through our life. We're just, we're just prone to oppose God. That's the nature that we were born with, that we were inherited from Adam. We're just born to oppose God. And sometimes we're controlled by other people to try to get it right. But unless something happens on our heart, we'll never get it right. We'll just be controlled by others. And so we invite Jesus in, then that alignment comes into play. But we have a nature exchange. I, I, you know, I knew this. There's sometimes that you just know this for a while, but I really didn't get it till I was on a mission trip to, to uh, India. And on that mission trip, there was a small group of us talking in the house, and I forget the topic, but the, I remember this guy saying, he said, I don't have within me the desire to do wrong anymore. I have the desire within me to please God. I don't have that old desire within me. That nature is not there. Now, having said that, can we still sin? Yes, because we choose to. The moment that you were born again, you were a sinner saved by grace. That phrase that's oftentimes used in certain circles, I'm just a sinner saved by grace, that happened once in your life. But now you are a saint that occasionally sins. That's what you are. You're a saint that occasionally sins, but you're not a sinner saved by grace. That happened one time and you're done. And that's what we should believe. I'm better than this. There's times that I have thoughts and attitudes in my life and they're like sometimes they get out or sometimes they linger too long and I literally think that thought or that attitude is not in my heart. I don't have that desire in my heart but it got pasted on me and it came up within me but that is not who I am. I literally tell myself at times I don't have that nature anymore. I may be bombarded from thoughts from another nature, but that is not in me. And we have to realize that, that we have a new nature within us. It's not the old nature anymore. We can give into it if we choose to, but we don't have to because we have the power of the Holy Spirit that we can rise above, cast it out, live above the line, whatever is needed. We can have that ability within us because Jesus lives within by the Holy Spirit. And that's great news. The world needs more Christians with that kind of understanding that what we've received we is both relational and it's supernatural. And that as we begin to relate to others, we need to be open, just as we heard testimonies this morning, we need to be open to realize that God will work relationally, but if it's just relational, it's not going to cut it. It's going to be a, a different way to live. It's going to be, well, that works for you, but I don't need that. It's going to be at a, at a level where, well, that's good for you, but... That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about a better life. I'm talking about a transformed life. 
And that's what the world needs to understand in Christianity, that it's not just a better way to live, even though it is, or a blessed way to live, even though it is. It's far greater than that. It means that we've been translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. That we had an old nature that is dead, that has been kicked out, that has been crucified. And we have been risen with Christ. And that's how we live. That's how we should be thinking about ourselves and living in that way. Well, maybe today you realized as I presented the gospel that it became clear to you for the first time. Maybe you're one of those that said an inside prayer and you never said an outside, an out, an, an, an out loud prayer. Well, I encourage you today, we're going to have altar ministries here in a little bit. And it's your choice to come and whatever God's pinpointed in your life that, that maybe you realize, wait a minute, I'm not sure this is in total alignment. I want to get it in line today. What will happen is refreshing will come over your life. When God's showing you something and you say, I want to meet with a brother or sister and I want to pray with them about this before I leave today. Maybe you've never made Jesus Lord of your life and today God has been drawing you all the way through this message don't put it off don't put it off scripture says that we're supposed to to uh, come to him while he may be found that's an interesting scripture respond to God while he may be found as if as if God goes on vacation or or get God's not there that's not true but our awareness our awareness of him can sometimes fade or get stronger our awareness and so if God's tugging on you to take care of something do it otherwise you're just going to have to live with it until you do something about it it'll come back around again God says I want to give you a gift I want to utilize the full gift that I gave you in Jesus don't waste the gift that he gave you save your life refresh you encourage you help you through a difficult time give you grace overcoming power don't 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 waste what Jesus did on the cross what a crying shame to waste have available and not receive the gift altar ministers would you come and